Um, so, you all are well aware of this tomorrow. I keep saying that because we always get to these things and people are like, I don't realize um, so I have to say it constantly so that there's not a surprise. Um, hopefully everyone's studying hard. Um, I'm around for most of today and all tomorrow morning. Um, if you have any questions, come see me. Um, the quiz is up to yesterday's tutorial, effectively. So uh, what you'll be doing is everything up to static failure for ductile material. So well, those, those three static failure laws. I've got some more static failure today. Um, but we won't be doing these on that quiz because this is for brittle materials. Um, but before we get to that, I have this diagram here which is um, effectively the 3D version of the failure surfaces that we've been talking about. So we've had sigma 1 and sigma 3 plot and you have like that ellipse for the von Mises um, theory. Well this is what it looks like in 3D. Um, and so the maximum distortion energy or the von Mises theory is a circle um, and it is effectively a, a cylinder, a circular prism going up on that sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3 axis that we were talking about on forever in the tension direction, on forever in the compression direction. Uh, the Tresca yield surface, so that's the maximum shear stress theory, is exactly the same except it is a hexagon. And so the reason that we have those, you know, that 2D plane that we have is because if you take a 2D section on any of those, you know, three planes that you could, um, that will become an ellipse for the maximum distortion energy, and it will become that kind of funny-looking um, square edge, straight edge type thing for the, the maximum shear stress. Okay. So that's what it looks like when it's not drawn wholly on the board. And the reason I'm bringing that up is we're starting to talk a little bit about 3D stress state. So you've got 2D stress state. Uh, you're familiar with how to get sigma 1, 2 and 3 when one of those is zero. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Have you guys seen stresses expressed in matrix form before? Show of hands who have. Okay. So if we look at our 2D stress state that we're relatively familiar with, and we have a normal stress sigma x and a normal stress sigma y. We technically have a number of different shear stresses. Um, technically, they're all the same value, right? So those shear stresses are all the same value, but you can actually give them two different uh, subscripts, I suppose. So, for example, this shear stress is on the x face because this face is, you know, the x side of the shape and it's going in the, in this case, y direction. So that's tau x, y. This stress is on the y face because it's on the you know, y direction face of the object going in the x direction, so that's tau y, x. We know that they're equal, but they're technically two different shears. And if we were to put that in tensor form, it would look like this. So sigma x and sigma y, so your normal stresses go down the diagonal, and then your shear stresses are in the top right and bottom left. And so that's basically, you could actually say xx, xy, yx, yy, if you wanted to. So that's your you know, matrix notation, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, etc. So that's effectively what's going on here. So we can express that in a matrix or a tensor. It's called tensors in stress. Um, and the reason that we do that is when we do things like finite elements, and you'll talk a little bit about this in finite elements, what you want to do is actually operate on these on the computer. And when you're operating on things on the computer, you can take that and make it into a big combined tensor for lots of different nodes, and then you can operate on that rather than doing all the individual operations. And it's far more efficient to do it that way. So in EG3001, you will need to work with matrices, tensors, etc. All right, so I'm just trying to highlight that to you now. Now, obviously, we have four stresses in 2D, and two of those are equal. In 3D, we have nine stresses, okay? And so exactly the same notation, we have our normal stresses. Now I've explicitly written it, so XX, YY, ZZ, all right? And so they go down our diagonal. And then on each face, we have a shear in each possible direction, all right? And so this face, looking at that, that's on the Z face, and we'll have one going Y direction, one going X direction. So we have tau ZY, tau ZX. 
and so forth. So each of those faces has those combinations of stress. And so they lay out like this. So we've got CX, X, XY, XZ, YZ, YY, y, YZ, ZX, ZY, ZZ. Okay? And it so happens that that's a symmetric tensor, which means that these bottom three are equal to these top three. Okay, which is what we know about shear, because with this one has to be equal to this one because they point at the same edge. This one has to be equal to this one because they point at the same edge. And this one has to be equal to this one because they point at the same edge. Okay? So it's exactly the same as this, it's just that we have nine components rather than four components in that four dimension. Okay? So those subscripts you might have seen in 3D stresses, but being able to put them in that matrix actually simplifies quite a bit of algebra that you might work in uh, when you get a little bit more advanced with this stuff. Okay? Now, as with our 2D case, um, this is the one that's a little bit more difficult to kind of conceptualise in your head. So in 2D, you've got shears and normal stresses and so forth. You can kind of picture how you can rotate that and get to a point where you only have normal stress. All right? Now, in 3D, you can still do that. So in 3D, I have this complex nine different types of stress, technically six unique stresses because of those three being equal. And I can rotate that around my three different axes to some configuration, and I can still pull out sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 in the absence of all shear, those principal stresses. Right? It's more difficult to conceptualise because you're talking about three-dimensional rotation, but it exists. All right? So you can calculate those three principal stresses. Uh, every single finite element software that you ever do will give you the three principal stresses of every single element by rotating in exactly this way. And the way that they actually calculate it, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. You ever just have a little little, little MA2000 tick. Um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues are very, very useful for this stuff. I'm not going to require you guys to do this, okay? So this is purely me exposing you to ideas that will be important for this stuff down the line, okay? But it's important to know because you guys have methods to get sigma 1, 2 and 3 when you're in 2D. This is how you get sigma 1, 2 and 3 when you're in 3D. Uh, and you also get the uh, three... Uh, principal planes, so out of this you can calculate what the actual angle of all of those spaces are. So instead of rotating a more circle, you can do that calculation as well. And effectively what you do is this matrix, which is our stress tensor, remember sigma x, 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 y, and so, and so forth, you have a dummy principal stress here and a principal stress vector. And this has to equal zero. Alright, so that's just a mathematical thing, I won't go into it, but if you can rotate that sigma, if you can rotate this tensor around to some plane, this is the rotation, and whatever value of sigma is the principal stress at that configuration. Alright, and a mathematical thing that we can do to calculate what sigma needs to be to satisfy that is if a matrix times a vector equals zero, then the determinant of that matrix has to equal zero. Okay. So that's a mathematical thing. Hopefully you've at least heard that somewhere along the line. It's just a maths identity of matrices. So if a matrix times a vector equals zero, then the identity of the matrix, uh, sorry, the determinant of the matrix must equal zero. Okay? And so what we can actually do, we've got equations to determine the determinant of a three by three matrix. We expand that out and we manipulate and play with play around with it and what we're left with is this sigma cubed minus c2 sigma squared minus c1 sigma minus c0 equals zero where c2 equals this combination of sig x's and sig y's and so forth c1 is a bunch of tau squared and some sigmas c0 is some sigmas and taus and so forth all right so if you know the applied stress element you know all of these values so you can get a single value for those and then we have a cubic. How many solutions are there to a cubic? Well, let's start with how many solutions are there to a quadratic? Possible solutions to the root. Two. So how many possible solutions are there to a cubic? Three. So there are three values of sigma that will satisfy this equation. And those three values of sigma 
uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Okay, so basically you solve that cubic, and you get three values of sigma, and then you have your three principal stresses. Very, very quick in a computer, very, very painful on a piece of paper. Okay, so that's why you don't do it in this subject, but a finite element software, if you were to ever write or have anything to do with, does this day in, day out, that's half the, half the game. Okay. Now, to get those rotations, just so you know, let's say we've calculated sigma 1, I sum it back into this equation, and I can calculate my vector. And that vector is the unit vector in the direction of that principal stress. I take sigma 2, I put it into this equation, calculate the vector, that vector is the unit vector in the direction of sigma 2, and so forth. Okay? So once you calculate sigma 1, 2, and 3 based on those cubics, you sum it back in, rearrange, and you'll get that, um, those three uh, unit vectors in the three principal directions. Okay? You don't need to know it for this subject, it's nice to know it as an engineer. Okay, and so it was, it was worthwhile just putting it here because when we talk about homoices, we're talking about homoices in three directions. Alright, so you might have, I, I think I gave you this homoices equation in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. Those are the three principal stresses. Um, and so if you had a 3D stress state, to use that equation, you'd need to be able to calculate those three principal stresses. Um, when you only have two principal stresses and say sigma 2 equals 0, that reduces to this nice equation there, if you have the principal stresses. And as I said to you, look in your textbook, what did I say, chapter 4 is it? Um, has some extra definitions for, uh, what have been chapter 6 actually, extra definitions for um, homoices. So this one is the 2D case, and this is now in applied stresses. So you don't need to use a more circle and so forth to calculate sigma 1, 2, and 3. Now you can just get your applied stress element. So sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy in that equation. And so this is the 3D equivalent of that if you have those, let's say, six unique stresses um, for the 3D stress state. So to calculate homoices, you don't need to calculate those three principal stresses. All right. Uh, but three principal stresses can be very important for analysis of various times. Alright, so that's hopefully just a little bit of exposure to what the 3D version of this is. Now we'll continue to talk about 2D stuff for pretty much the rest of this subject. But 2D isn't because 3D, the third dimension, doesn't exist. 2D is because that's the stuff we can analyse by hand. As soon as you start getting into the three dimensional stuff, that's when you start having to use finite element software. Uh, Finite element software does exactly the same job as what you're doing in this subject. It's just that it does some of those calculations on the computer for you because you can't do it feasibly by hand in a time frame that's going to solve anyone's problems. Alright, so that's pretty much the end of the, the ductile material static value theories and this is an image of experimental tests. So this is, let's say someone's taken a ductile material and they've done biaxial testing. So that's, you get effectively a square and you have the ability to stretch it this way and either stretch or compress it in this direction. So two different types of loading. And based on that, you can load it up with a particular sigma 1 and sigma 3 value on your principal stress element. And so change that sigma 1 and sigma 3 based on the ratio of the stretch for the biaxial testing. And so you can get different points around this curve. And you can see for the circular one, that's a nickel chromium moly mole or whatever that is. Uh, that's an alloy steel basically. Um, and so that's a nice ductile alloy steel. And look where those circles lay. They lay nicely around this. We've got 1023 steel, again ductile, nice flat circles around the edge there. We've got a couple of different types of aluminium are the square shapes. We don't have a lot up here, but we have them lining up along that very nicely. And then these triangles, grey cast iron. Grey cast iron is not ductile. Grey cast iron is a very well-known brittle material. Okay, and you can see that that brittle material is lining up well with the maximum normal stress theory, um, or something like that, at least in this sort of range. Okay, so. The, the theories that we've got to and calculated, and because of all the elegance that I was talking about, probably in Wednesday's lecture, where it's actually calculated from real energy and physics, what's going on at the 
effectively at the atomic level. Um, then that's why this von Weisses, this maximum distortion energy theory is so neat and so nicely aligned with those experiments because that's what's actually happening in the material. Alright, static failure of brittle materials. Um, for no other reason than to wake you up, put your devices out, find me, look up brittle materials on Wikipedia. Yeah, well that's assuming anyone gets any signal in here. There's a router literally right there, so hopefully there's some internet somewhere. So it's, it's the same size circle, it's just in compression. And 
this value here, we can call SUC, so S, the stress ultimate in compression. And we're using ultimate now, remembering that the point of yield is also the point of failure. So the ultimate strength of a material is the point at which it breaks. And so for, duck, uh, for brittle materials, the point at which it breaks is also the yield point. So we just talk about the breakage point of the yield. There's no point to talk about yield. It's confusing if you use yield there. So we've got SUC, so the ultimate in compression. SUT, the ultimate in tension. And they're the same for that material. Okay. Uh, and so that's called an even material. Now, what you find with most brittle materials, particularly things like cast metals, cast iron, cast steel, that sort of thing, is that they are uneven. You do these same tests, and in tension you get a particular strength, and so that might look like this, and you'll get a, a UT, so an ultimate in tensile, and in compression, the compression test might look like this, it might be a much larger, more circle, and the ultimate compression might be much, much larger. So oftentimes brittle materials are much stronger in compression than they are in tension. Think of concrete. Yeah? Concrete's effectively useless in tension unless you've got steel rebar in it, but in compression it can take amazing loads. Rocks. Rocks can take fantastic compressive loads, not so much in tension. Okay? So brittle materials have a tendency to be really good in compression and not very good in tension. The reason Brittle materials are generally characterised by micro flaws, or you know, to the point of uh, probably you know up to millimetre level flaws throughout their cross section. So they're not homogeneous. They have these little micro bubbles and cracks and bits of graphite and all sorts of things on the inside of them, right? And so when you think about taking something and putting tension on it with all of these micro flaws, everything we know about stress concentration is that's going to crack. Yeah. So a little tiny bubble on something in tension is a very, very high stress concentration. That stress concentration, as soon as it reaches the stress that it needs to to get to ultimate effectively, you've got a little crack and off it goes. In compression, and I think I talked about this. Those bubbles and micro flaws and things, they close up. And so instead of just you know, being the cause of the failure, if they close up, you could think of them having no effect. So now it's just the material. And in a lot of brittle materials, it actually helps having those little flaws. And those little flaws close up. Because on that brittle test, if you imagine you've got a, a, sphere, uh, sorry, a cylinder of concrete, right, and you squash it, the way that something like that in compression fails is on a, a shear plane. So on sort of a 45 degree sometimes. So as you push it down, then it'll just give way and the, the parts will sort of slide off each other, right? So that shear plane, that 45 degrees or 60, or depending on what your combination between you know, shear and normal failure on compression, that's going to be cracks going sort of this way. And now, if you've got all of these micro flaws, and those micro flaws have closed up, and you have a crack propagating down at the 45 degrees, and you hit this micro flaw, on the top side you're going to be cracked, but there's actually no material connection between the top and bottom. So that crack potentially could be stopped at that micro flaw. So the, the actual stress concentration from that doesn't get carried directly underneath because the material is not connected. So that crack can actually stop on that micro floor. And so the micro floor, when it's closed up, can actually have a, a strengthening effect on the brittle material in compression. Because once you get a little crack, that crack might, have, might not get very far. And so that's why for many brittle materials, it's not just a matter of the fact that the micro floors don't have an effect uh, or weakening effect. They can have a strengthening effect. You can get vastly stronger materials in compression than tension. Uh, for some brittle materials like that. Alright, so it's fundamentally, if you just got a perfectly homogeneous bit of this material, chances are it might start to behave a little bit more even. But because you've got those micro flaws, micro flaws in tension, they're really bad, and in compression, they're either, you know, have no effect or potentially a little bit better as well. And then what we need to do is start thinking about failure planes in that compression as well. So we talked a little bit about the way that things fail in tension. Um, so 
Printable materials tend to fail due to normal, so they'll fail on a straight plane in tension. Um, ductile materials tend to fail on a 45 because it's a shear plane. There's a really good example of that here. Um, it's a bit hard to see on this slide. Maybe you can see that a bit better on the slides when you look at it at home. Uh, but this one here in the top right is a ductile material. And you see the initial. So this is obviously the initial steel. And then this is it failed. And you can see that the actual failure plane, if you look closely, is approximately 45 degrees. You look really closely, you've got something called necking. Have you guys seen a tensile test of ductile material, how it necks down? So it's not as exaggerated what you can see there because of the part of that's actually the neck. So if you look closely and ignore the necking part, then it's almost exactly on a 45 that value plane on that bit of material there. And for a ductile material, and this is, sorry, this is a brittle material and a tensile test specimen, and you can see it's almost a bold straight line. Yeah. And that's exactly what we expect for those materials. Now, when we talk about compression, this is a ductile material and it effectively, effectively just squashes down until it's as small as the machine can squash it. There's not a lot of real failure going on there. Um, it's, it's obviously failed, it's, it's in the plastic zone, but that compressive plastic zone is very, very long for a ductile material. Okay? So it's uh, effectively, it's not fractured, it's not had that catastrophic failure, it's just lost all resemblance of what it was before it got tested. And then in compression, like I was saying, that failure tends to happen along that sort of, if not a 45 degree, then some sort of an angled, so this is my diagram of it, an angle that suggests that it's some combination of shear and normal. So if that was 45 degrees, then we'd be pretty confident it was just shear. But not ordinarily, it's either sort of 30 degrees or 60 degrees, which is telling us it's some combination of normal and shear, and we need to get that right in our failure surface. Okay. And then if we have torsion, we've got ductile torsion. Remember what a uh, stress element for a uh, pure torsion looks like? So if we had... Yeah. Yeah. Torsion. Stress element on the top there. Goes that way. Looks like this. No normal stresses. Where's the maximum shear plane? So, along here. So the maximum is going to be at the outside, but see, do we need to rotate this element around at all to increase that maximum shear? If I was to draw a more circle, and I drew that element, the more circle would look like, you know, let's call that top and right. Top would be here, right would be down here, more circle looks like that. Do I need to rotate around from these points to get the maximum shear? Am I already there? I'm already there. And so that maximum shear plane is that sort of perpendicular to the axis of the shaft. And so if we've got a ductile material and we're failing on the maximum shear plane, in pure torsion we would expect a perfectly horizontal failure. And if you look at the example here, pure torsion on a ductile material, you can even see the the lines as this thing really talked around, lots of plastic deformation there. But once it's actually failed, it's failed on a perfectly straight line. <coughs> and the reason is this, we're already at the maximum shear plane in that horizontal plane. It doesn't need to go on any angles or rotate that element around. Okay? Um, and then for a brittle material, it happens again. It's some sort of hybrid of shear and normal. It's not straight, it's not 45 degrees, it's some sort of, you know, 60 or 30 or something like that. So what that's telling us is that we need some sort of a failure theory that allows for a combination of normal and shear to be causing failure. All right? And so that's what these uh, brittle material failure theories actually give us. There's a few of them. Uh, max normal for even materials, we've done, right? Max normal for even materials just means that square's the same distance up as it is down. Uh, we've got maximum normal stress for uneven materials, this is a really basic accounts of different strength in tension and compression. And then they were finding that this is actually pretty inaccurate in a couple of zones on that sigma 1, sigma 3 failure surface. And so they started to try and improve it. The first attempt was a cool uh, uh, on ball theory, and the second one was a modified ball theory. 
And I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. I'm going to show you this value surface and I'm going to give you the equations and you're going to have a go at it. But this is what they look like. Alright, so lots of lines here. Don't get too confused. Sigma 1, sigma 3. So this is our same failure in 2D. Um, assuming into the page is 0. And this nice even square here is our normal stress theory for even materials. That's the one we've done. So this point here is SUT and this point here is just negative SUT. Okay? So the same ultimate intention and compression. Now, if I have a different value in compression to tension, then that's what this yeah, that big looking square is. All right, so sigma one's in tension, so obviously SUT. Sigma three's in tension, obviously SUT. Sigma one's in compression, so that's SUC, so the ultimate in compression. Sigma three's in compression, and that's SUC as well. Okay, and so you just draw a big box around that guy, and that's your value surface. So. Um, the the uh, equations are almost as simple as for the actual normal stress theory, and I'll give them to you. Now, what they were finding, so let's say that we've got one principle is in tension, one principle is in compression. They were finding that things in this zone, where the theory is saying it's safe, were actually failing. They didn't know how far up to they didn't have a good feeling for how far up before they'd done lots and lots of experiments and formulated a couple of theories. So the first attempt to deal with the fact that stuff's failing in this little quadrant here in that corner was just connect those two dots, that straight line there. And the same thing this way, because it's exactly the same, just a flipped around element. And so that's called the, Co the Coulomb-Moore theory. And then with some more experiments and a little bit more investigation, it was found that that's probably a little bit over-conservative because we're saying that something in this region has failed, but that it actually hasn't failed in the experiments. So we're finding that we probably get down to this SUT value, except in negative, and then from that point we come down on a diagonal. And that is the modified Moore theory, and that's the one that we're sitting on pretty happily for brittle materials these days. Um, you could probably get a little bit more accurate, but it's not quite the same as ductile materials. There's not as much of a, that sort of elegant association between internal energy and um, actual, or oh, sorry, internal, yeah, energy and, and failure. Largely because of those micro flaws. So those micro flaws are potentially, you know, lots of them or few of them all over the place. You can't really um, deal with the heterogeneous material with a single nice empirical relationship like you can with a homogeneous material. So, I mean, you could conceptually you could think that maybe there's actually a slightly curved version of this, but the extra effort that that takes to um, actually formulate is not worth the extra accuracy that you might get from that. Remembering that the difference between our maximum shear stress and our maximum log mice is only an order of a couple of percent anyway. It's just that that one's nice and easy to calculate. This would be very complicated. So we're not going to bother. We're going to stick with those straight lines because it's nice and accurate. And the uh, potential for error on a brittle material is much higher than a ductile material as well because, again, with those micro fours, you can't have anywhere near the confidence interval that you might on the experiments from a ductile material because they could be vastly different. All right, and you see some uh, tensile tests or some biaxial tests on, what is this, grey cast iron. And you see that they line up pretty nicely with that modified Moore's theory. And like I was saying, it's just sort of creeping just outside that line there, yeah? But fundamentally, that line is, is at the very least, conservative. Yeah? So that's, that's fine. That's good. We're happy with that. Okay? Now, some equations you'll have to go, and then I'll give you another, we'll have another example practice for tomorrow, um, and then we'll be done. So, you guys see those?
These are not very neat equations. They're kind of a pain in the ass uh, because they have all of these conditions. So we don't have a single nice surface equation that we can use. Instead, you've got to work out which one of those quadrants you're in. Okay. So in the first instance, for that ma for that maximum normal stress theory for uneven materials, it just takes the minimum of SUT divided by sigma one, assuming sigma one's in tension and SUC divided by sigma 3, assuming that's in compression. <coughs> so, take the maximum tension normal stress and you compare that to the tensile ultimate stress and you take the maximum compressive principal stress and compare that to the compressive ultimate strength. Okay, so, if all three are in tension, this doesn't even come into play, or SU uh, sigma three is like, you know, uh, effectively a, a positive number. SUC is a negative number, and, and it, it, it loses all meaning. So you don't use that if your sigma three isn't a negative number, effectively. Okay. This is just really just rational thinking. Okay, so it's, it's not a black box equation so much as if you've got a tension stress, the maximum tension compared to the ultimate intention, you've got a compressive, you compare the maximum compressive to the compressive ultimate, yeah? Um, and then you just take the minimum factor of safety. So if you're closer to the failure uh, intention than you are to failure in compression, that's your factor of safety. So that's why we've got this, this min operator there for the, for the normal stress. Okay, so you just have to use rational thought and just apply what you understand about the theory. Cool. The next one. Now, um, I put this here because whenever there's an SUC or a, uh, let's say, sigma 3, and we assume sigma 3 is negative for all of these equations. If it's not, then it doesn't matter. Um, if we look at this, let's say this one. If sigma 1 is positive and sigma 3 is negative, we're in this quadrant. And that's effectively what we're calculating, OK? If sigma 1 and 3 are positive, then we're in this quadrant and we understand what to do with that rule because that's the same as the normal stress theory for even materials. If sigma 1 and 3 are both compressive, then we just have this box and that's the rule for um, uneven materials effectively, but we just compare them both to the ultimate compressive strength. It's a box. It's easy. All right? If you're in this top quadrant, then it's effectively the same as being in that bottom quadrant. You just sequence them, so you don't need to ever calculate it up here because if you've got a positive sigma 3 and a negative sigma 1, just flip them around and it's the same as this. Yeah? So the only time that you need to do this complicated equation that isn't just compared to the tension one or compared to the compression one is if you're in this bottom right-hand quadrant. All right? And the only time when you're in that bottom right-hand quadrant is when sigma 1 is a positive and sigma 3 is a negative and sigma 2 is a zero. Okay, so we're on board with when we're actually applying these equations. Cool. So the first thing you do is look at your sig 1, 2, and 3 and work out which quadrant you're in, I guess. Then you come to this guy, um, and we've got three conditions. And for the Coulomb-Moore theory, the Coulomb-Moore theory is this straight line there. And so if sigma 1 is greater than 0 and sigma 3 is less than 0, then this is the equation. And that equation is the equation to that diagonal line there. Okay? And so you can calculate whatever sigma 1 is. Let's say it's 100 megapascals and SUT is 200 megapascals. Those numbers go in there. Sigma 3 is a negative number and you actually put the negative in this equation. And SUC is a negative number and you put the negative in that equation. So if it's negative 200 and negative 400, the negatives cancel out. Okay? So those negatives technically should cancel out in that equation. The only reason we do it, it's kind of arbitrary, but on the next equation that becomes very important. Okay. So, sub those values in, easy enough. Um, if sigma 3 is greater than 0, then that means you're in this top right hand quadrant, or at least at the top. Um, but if sigma 3 and sigma 1 are sequenced, and sigma 1 is always bigger than sigma 3, then that means you're in that top quadrant which is just our, our tension equation, which is what I was saying, that simple, normal, maximum normal stress. And if sigma 1 is less than 0, it means they're both in that bottom left-hand side, and at which point you just use the um, SUC on sigma 3. Okay. 
So very, very simple, but it's, it's, it's more clunky than the ductile stuff because you have to choose that quadrant and choose a different equation depending on where you are. The last one, modified Moore theory. Same again, we need to do a bunch of different stuff. But, <coughs> remember this time, we have this line going down here. And so effectively anything in this box here will behave just like the normal stress theory, uh, the even normal stress theory. And then this part here is what we need to actually worry about in terms of where that line is. So in terms of the, our conditions, if sigma 3 is greater than minus SUT, so if sigma 3 is greater than minus SUT, so that's the tension one, that's this line here, and you're saying sigma 3 is greater than that point. So this is minus SUT, you're saying sigma 3 is bigger than that. So that means you're anywhere up here, effectively in this part here, because we've sequenced them, so you know you're to the right at least. So anywhere there, and you just use the maximum normal stress theory. Easy enough? And that's uh, this guy. Just the, the tensile unit stress or the tensile ultimate stress on sigma 1. Done. The sigma 1 is more than sigma 3 because we've sequenced them, right? If your sigma 1 is less than 0, once again, that's proving that if sigma 1 is less than 0, sigma 3 has to be less than that because we've sequenced them. You're in this bottom quadrant there. Again, you're using the same relationship, which is the ultimate compression on sigma 3. Sigma 3 being the smallest, we've sequenced them. And if sigma 1 is greater than 0, and sigma 3 is less than minus SUT, that means you're in this zone here. So sigma 1 greater than 0, sigma 3 less than minus SUT, then you need to do this line there. And you need to work out whether you're inside that line or outside that line. And that's this equation. So whatever sigma 1 is, be a positive. SUT is a positive. SUC is a negative. Uh, and then sigma 3 is a negative. SUC is a negative. And you just use those equations. It's, it's, you can actually formulate those if you were to look at the equation of that line and formulate the equation of that line, just you know, mx plus c um, equals 1, and then rearrange that to um, get, get a factor of safety. Cool. So you can formulate that yourself. It's just really a clunky geometric relationship that we're talking about trying to fit within that yield surface. Okay. So let's have a go. <coughs>
sorry, I've drawn a kind of crashed up over there so you guys might have some chance of seeing it. So sigma x is 50 megapascals, sigma y is a compressive 300 megapascals, and tau xy is 140 megapascals. Alright, so I'll leave that up there for the minute, and we'll go through those, and then I'll put the next one, the, the next equations up there for you, and then, then you can have to go up the third part. In our solution, let's do the first thing. Uh, you've got more circles than all the rest of it, I'm sure. <coughs> Alright, what we get? Sigma 1. 99.1 megapascals. 99.1 megapascals. Excellent. What about sigma 2? 0. 0. 0 megapascals. Sigma 3. Which of those three categories are we in? First one. First one? So sigma 1 is greater than 0 and sigma 3 is less than 0 which means we're in the bottom right hand quadrant which means we have that line that we need to work out whether we're inside or outside. So therefore 1 on n equals sigma 1 on SUT plus sigma 3 on SUC. 99.1 on 200 and notice this is all megapascals but because it's all megapascals I'm self consistent if that confuses you please put the by 10 to the 6s on everything um, but if you're working only in megapascals and the result is a ratio so a non-dimensional number like n then you can work in megapascals and it's completely consistent don't do it because I said it don't do it because it works do it because you understand it don't understand why megapascals works here, please put it in pascals and work in meters and newtons and pascals all the time. Okay, so it's up to you. Work within your own level of understanding. Alright, and then that's negative 349.1 on negative 600, which obviously cancels out to a positive. Rearrange all of that. What did we get for n? 0 0.93. 0.9 what? 3? 3? 
So the maximum normal stress theory says it's safe. The, what are we, Coulomb law theory says we're failed. I'm going to draw the, the phase surface up in a minute. But just looking at it, we're in the bottom right hand quadrant there. Does it make sense that that would be more conservative than that? Yeah, yeah, obviously that's a big box and that's a diagonal. So some, this is saying that we're outside of the diagonal, but we're inside of the box. Makes sense to us. Okay? Alright, I'll turn this back on and put the other equation up, and you guys can do part C. You have it already? Outside by uh, what 0.4 was it? 
9-ish, so that means we're close to the line, but we're failing. Seems about right. This guy, we were 1.1, which means we're inside, but we're just barely inside. So, I've got a bunch of numbers. They kind of seem like random. This one's failing, that one's not failing. I've now looked at the real interpretation of that, and the result makes perfect sense to me. Okay? So that's the reason for these things. You don't have to do it in an analysis. If you're comfortable using the equations and you believe your maths, feel free to do it. But engineers check. And if we don't have methods to check, we come up with ways of checking. Because it's really important. All right? Because when you're actually doing this for keeps and either people's lives are on the line or you're building something that um, could you know, halt production and cost millions of dollars, or you're building something that your company's going to make tens of thousands of, and if it goes wrong, then you have to buy tens of thousands of them back. The stakes are high, and so you need the ability to check every single little calculation you do, such that when you give a big result, it's you know it's meaningful. All right, I reckon that's about enough for today, guys. I've got an example that I am not going to do. I'm going to put it online uh, with the solution there for you that you can use for study. I'll do it as soon as I get a copy and get to my office. Um, Please do it before you look at the solution to it. I say this time and time again. The second you look at that solution, it's completely worthless. Or it's mostly worthless. It's like 95% worthless. Okay? So, so please have a go at it. Potentially in exam conditions. So sit yourself down, give you 15 minutes and close the door. And just look at it dumbfounded for a little while. It's an easy question, so you won't look at it dumbfounded, but just give you that exam condition stuff. Uh, and then mark your own work or mark someone else's work. Alright, I'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. Have a study.